How's it going everyone? In today's video we're going to be learning about five good Python habits that you can use immediately in your code. And for this tutorial we'll be using Z. In case you feel like trying out Z, you can find the download link in the description box down below. Anyway, the first good Python habit is using pathlib instead of raw strings for file paths. Pathlib is cross-platform by default, more readable and provides a clean object-oriented interface. My recommendation is to always use pathlib for any path operations. It's just better. But let's look at the old way first, then see how pathlib makes everything cleaner and more reliable. So the old way would be to import os, and here we could create a path by using os.path.join. And if we were to print it, we would get this file path back. Now, even if this works, it's more verbose and error prone especially on Windows. So what we're going to do instead is import path from pathlib. And now to create a path, all we need to do is instantiate the path and use slashes. So here we can type in files slash example.txt. And now when we run this, what we should get back is a file path that is cleaner, more readable, and also cross-platform by default. Let's see some practical examples of what pathlib can do. In this example, we're going to create a configuration file, where this doesn't actually create the file, but creates a path object. Since we did not create that configuration file, it's good to check whether it exists or not. I mean, behind the scenes, I did create it, as you can see up here, I have a config folder with the settings.json. But nowhere in our code did we tell Python to create that file. So chances are, if you run this very same code, you're not going to have that file. Then right below, we're going to see what the parent is, what the name is, and what the suffix is of this path. And right now, if we were to run this, we would get back that a configuration file exists at this location. The parent is config, which is this part over here. The file name is called settings.json, which is this part over here. And the suffix is this part over here, the .json. If you want to create a directory, you just need to create another path object with the directory that you want to create. Then we can use the make directory method, set parents to true, exist can be set to okay, and that's going to create a directory as soon as we run the script. But let's also add an output file. And inside this output file, we want to add a results.txt file. Then we can also write some text to that file so it's not empty. And finally, we're going to print that we wrote to the output file and we're going to read it. So now when we run this, what we should get as an output is that we wrote to this location. And you can tell it worked because we were able to read from that file. Otherwise, you can open up the sidebar and look for the data slash output folder. And inside the results, you should have hello pathlib. And once again, the key advantages of using pathlib is that it's cross-platform by default, more readable, object-oriented, less error prone and has better IDE support. My recommendation is to always use pathlib instead of raw strings or os.path for any file path operations. Moving on to the second good Python habit, which is using data classes for simple data containers instead of writing classes with init methods. For simple data containers, data classes are cleaner, less error prone and automatically generate useful methods for you. Let's compare the old way with the modern data class approach. In this example, we're going to create a class called point alt, which is the old way of writing a data class. As you can see here, we need to create an init block. We need to take X and Y, and we need to assign both of those to the instance. Then if we want a representation of this object, we need to write it ourselves. And also to make sure that we can compare it to other point objects, we're going to have to write that functionality ourselves, which is a lot of work just for a simple point. A better approach is to import data class from data classes. Now, all we need to do is create a class called point and use the data class decorator. And that's all we had to do here, just three lines. And what's cool about this is that a data class automatically generates the init block, the wrapper block, and the equals block. So we don't have to code that functionality manually. So the key advantages of data classes is that it has less boilerplate, required type hints, automatic method generation, and they are less error prone. 
my recommendation is to use data classes for any simple data container class. And to use them is quite simple. As you can see here, inside the if name is equal to main check, we have three points. And to create a point, we just need to supply x and y. Then we can print point one and point two and compare them. And when we run this, what we should get as an output are the points with a beautiful representation and the comparison. Point one is equal to point two because they contain the same data, but point one is not equal to point three. The third good Python habit we're going to cover is using the logging module instead of print statements for output. Now I know print statements are convenient and they work fine for quick scripts, but for any serious code, logging is just so much better. It gives you control over output levels, formatting, and where the output goes. In this example, I'm going to show you the old way, using print statements everywhere. Then we'll see how logging can give you much better control and flexibility. My recommendation is to always use logging for any code that might run in production or needs different levels of output. So let's get started by creating a function that processes some data. And we're going to call it process data old way. And that takes a list of integers, which will just be the data. Now here we're going to print that we're starting to process that data. If there is no data, we're going to warn that there's no data to process. And we're just going to leave the function early. Otherwise, we're going to process that data. And for item in data, if the item is less than zero, we're going to print that there was a negative value found. And we're going to skip the processing of that item. Then at the bottom, when we're done, we're going to print that we finished processing that data. The problem with print statements is that you can't easily control the output level. You can't filter messages or redirect them to different places. Plus, you can't distinguish between debug info, warning, and errors without manually adding prefixes like error or warning. Now let's see the modern way with logging. And to use logging, we need to import logging. And the very first thing we need to do is configure the logger. So we're going to be using basic config followed by the configuration. In a real application, you typically do this once at the start of your program. So here we're setting the level to logging.info. This will be how we will format each message. And for the timestamps, we're going to format it like this. Now to get a logger for the current module, we're going to have to use get logger followed by the name. Then we can recreate the exact same function, except this time, instead of using print, we're going to use the logger. So once again, we have this function that processes data. And at the beginning, we log that we're starting to process the data. Notice that we have these methods here, such as dot info and dot warning and dot error, instead of just the regular print. What's nice about this is that we can later filter these in case we just want to see the warnings or the errors. And we're just using the logger everywhere that we would have used the print statement. Personally, I love logging because you can set different levels and control what gets output. For example, in development, you might want debug level to see everything, but in production, you'd use info or warning level to reduce the noise. So right now, if we were to run this by processing the data, what we would get as an output are these statements. So here we would get the timestamp, the module, the level, and the message. Let's see some more advanced logging features. First of all, as I mentioned earlier, we can use different levels of logging, such as debug, info, warning, error, and critical. You can even log exceptions, which is quite cool. And when we run this, we will get all of the messages back besides the debug one, because that's only used for debugging. And on top of everything I just showed you, you can also configure logging to write to files. And to do so, first we need to create a file handler, which will equal logging.filehandler, and the name of the file that you want to contain the logs. Then we can set the level to be logging.debug, and below we can create a console handler, which will equal a stream handler, and that's going to be set to logging.info. Then we can create a formatter, which will equal the logging.formatter. And this is how we want to display the information in the log file. We can set the formatter for the file handler and for the console handler. And then finally, we want to create a root logger and set the level to debug and add these two handlers. And now when we run our program with logs, you're going to notice that in the sidebar or in your project, you're going to have a new file called app.log. And this is going to tell us everything that happened in our program. So now we have all of that in a file, which we can read later or analyze later. So my recommendation is to use logging for any code that's more than a quick script, even for small scripts, 
logging is better because you can easily adjust the verbosity level without changing your code. And I know it takes some time to get used to, but you will thank yourself for it once you learn how to use it. The fourth good Python habit is using guard clauses instead of deeply nested if-else statements. Guard clauses make your code more readable by reducing nesting and making the happy path clearer. Let's compare the old way, the pyramid of doom, with guard clauses. So here we're going to create a very silly function called process user. And this is going to be done the old way. And Pydantic is really unhappy with this because it has no idea what type this dictionary is. But that's okay, we're going to ignore that for now. What's important to note here is that we have a lot of if-else statements. And while the logic is sound and robust, it's just not ideal. Because if we ever decide to come back to this, it's going to be a nightmare. So what we're going to do instead is use the guard clause. And the guard clause is practically just an early return. And the key advantages of using the guard clause is that it reduces nesting, it gives us early returns, we have a clear happy path, and it's much less of a cognitive load. Because now we have all the logic again on one indentation level. And it's easy to see what conditions need to pass for us to reach the happy path. My recommendation is to always use God clauses for validation and error checking instead of deeply nested if else statements. The fifth and final good Python habit is avoiding name shadowing. Name shadowing happens when you use a variable name that's already used in an outer scope, like built-in functions, which causes errors. Let's see an example where shadowing actually causes an error. So here we're going to create a function called process numbers old way. And this takes a list of numbers and returns a number. Now here we can pass in a sum, which will equal zero. And for number in numbers, we're going to add that number to the sum. Now imagine you want to use the built-in sum function inside the same function. If we try to use it and return the other total, what we're going to get as an output is nothing until we call this function. So let's call it by typing in process numbers old way and pass in a list of one and two. Now, when we run this, what we're going to get back is a type error because int is not callable. And this all happened because of name shadowing. Here we overwrote the built-in sum function and turned it into an integer, which means we can no longer call it later. You never want to shadow built-in functions because then you end up with errors like this one. And when you hover over it, you just wonder, why can't you call sum? It's a built-in function, it should work, literally in any scope. The solution is to use a good descriptive name that doesn't shadow. For example, we can change this to total, and obviously we need to change this to sum, otherwise it defeats the purpose. And now when we run this, it's going to work just fine. Although to get an output, we should print the result. And here we get 63. So the key point here is that you should avoid shadowing built-ins, such as sum, list, string, and so on. You do not want to do that because it's going to create problems in your program. Use descriptive names instead to prevent type error bugs. And also consider yourself lucky if you do get a type error, because sometimes the code is going to run even if you're using the shadowed name. And that's when it really becomes a real headache. Anyway, that's really all I wanted to cover in today's video. Do let me know in the comment section down below whether you have any good habits of your own that you would like to share with other devs. I'm sure they would be happy to read about it. Otherwise, with all that being said, as always, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.